As you understand from my name and from my accent, I'm German. I was born in Germany during the time of Nazi dictatorship. I did not know what went on in Germany until I was a teenager. And I found out about the, the terrible things that people did to people. And I have spoken and I have written about the terrible experience of the Holocaust. I even gave a paper two years ago right here on that topic. Well, the next speaker has a connection to the Holocaust. Some of his family members went to some of the concentration camps. When I was a teenager, I went to all the concentration camps as a pilgrimage to cry and to ask God for forgiveness and for wisdom to overcome. We are very happy that we have as a second speaker, also a scholar, who comes from the Jewish tradition. You can read everything in the book much better than I can tell you. Let's welcome him and you may sit down. Good morning. Good morning. I get to see your beautiful faces, and uh, I want to particularly thank Chris Wright for the wonderful devotional he's just given. And uh, Chris Wright really taught me to read the Hebrew Bible from a missiological perspective and to see God's purposes for Israel and for all nations, not just the Hebrew Bible, but the whole of the scriptures. So I'm very grateful to Chris, not just for the leadership that he gave in the Lausanne movement and continues to give, but also for keeping my friend Shalkat Mukhari and me in order. Uh, it took a Northern Irishman to do it. <laughs> Uh, but we were there constantly arguing and debating with each other. Uh, I want also in my welcoming remarks just to say how grateful I am to be welcomed here and how overwhelmed I have been by the love and the warmth and the openness that I've received as a Jewish believer in Jesus, the Messianic Jew, from my Palestinian and my Arab Christian brothers and sisters and from everyone here. And I'm really here to listen and to learn and to make new friends and uh, therefore I am speaking now I'm sure I'm going to put my foot in it and offend somebody but I try to only offend my friends so and if you're Christians you have to forgive me anyway and I found <laughs> I found it helped to ask for forgiveness first and then if, but please forgive me oh there you are notes okay a sign from God so, I want to also just say that I'm very much here to share a journey that I'm on, a journey towards reconciliation that passes through the checkpoint. So, I'm not here to advocate a particular position on Israel and the promises of God. Wayne Hillsden did that excellently well. I could not possibly hope to better that. But I'm here really to ask you to help me to make the journey to reconciliation and to really discover what it means for us to be united, as, as Chris just said in that Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, one new man. And I also need to say, especially as others will be watching what I say, that I am not representing any other individual, group, or organization apart from myself. And I don't even agree with myself all the time. <laughs> so I am here as an individual, a Jewish believer in Jesus. I'm not claiming to represent any other group or organization. And uh, therefore, please accept that as my personal contribution and statement. But I would nevertheless like to thank all those who have helped me with their encouragement, their constructive criticism, and their prayers. And you know who you are 
that has brought me here. I have 24 minutes to speak, but it's really taken me 24 years to get to this point. It hasn't been an easy journey for me, although I know it's a lot harder for many of you. And so I'd like to ask the Lord to help. Let's pray. Lord, please turn us from victims into visionaries. Please, Lord, may the sweet savour of your Holy Spirit unite our hearts in the love of Jesus and in the worship of the one true God. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I borrowed the graphic from Salim Manaya, Reconciliation from a Messianic Jewish perspective. I hope you can see the screen at the back. Can you see it at the back okay? Uh, because I'm going to go fairly quickly. You need to know where I'm coming from. This is my great-grandfather, Richard Hirschland. So I was named after him. And uh, he was one of the Hirschland family, the land of the deer, who came from Essen in northern Germany. And uh, this was the family home, uh, which there were many Hirschlands, thousands of them actually, uh, this was the home. Uh, this was the family bank, uh, although I'm sorry, uh, I, I cannot give it all into the contributions this evening. Uh, <laughs> it was taken from us by the Nazis, as was our home, as was uh, many of my family relations. And uh, now all there is is a public square named after us, Hirschland Platz, the place of Hirschland. And uh, we even have an underground station named after us, and these are some of my Hirschland cousins visiting. But Richard Hirschland was one of uh, three brothers and about uh, five or six sisters. And he and his two brothers came to London in the 1890s. This was the synagogue in Essen. Has anybody been there? Where it's still standing, miraculously, it wasn't bombed during the war. And uh, you can see the... Uh, Name of Hirschland as one of the founding members. The Hirschlands, when there weren't rabbis in the town, they acted as the rabbis as well. And uh, you can see, if you can just read it there, the sign, it says, Brothers Hirschland, London. And they were some of the people who had contributed to the building of the synagogue. And, of course, you can see on the top there, there's also Adolf Hirschland, because Adolf was a very popular boy's name. And my father was called Adolf Hirschland until another Adolf came along, it was a popular name. And then when he was brought up in England, one day he was told, Hirschland, in future you will be known as Harvey. So Harvey, nice British name, but uh, it's actually only two or three generations. Because in 1939, as you know, Kristallnacht, the synagogue was destroyed, Jewish people were thrown out of their homes, their shops, and uh, the Holocaust came. My family, my immediate family, survived because we were already in Britain. But that's where I come from. So for me, it's, it's very moving that Sami Awad had the opportunity to go and visit the concentration camps, that Manfred has just spoken about them. I'm not asking for pity, but I am asking for you to understand where I'm coming from as a, a second or third generation post-Holocaust European Messianic Jew, uh, not an Israeli uh, at the moment, but uh, that's where I'm coming from. And yet when I found the Messiah, I found that there was nothing more Jewish than believing in the Jewish Messiah. Here is the picture by Marc Chagall, white crucifixion, Jesus very audaciously wrapped in a talis, a prayer shawl, uh, and surrounded by examples of the wandering Jew, persecution, uh, devastation, etc. It's a beautiful picture showing Yeshua within the Jewish context, just as we need to see Jesus within his Palestinian context as well. And so when I found that I was Jewish and I believed in Jesus, I had the best of both worlds and double the problems. You get Saturdays off and Sundays, it's very useful. Uh, <laughs> You get Christmas and Hanukkah, uh, but on the other hand, you have a few issues. And it's a Jew. I define this very broadly in a way that challenges the boundaries of both religious groups. Messianic Judaism, Jews who believe in Jesus, a Jewish form of Christianity, a Christian form of Judaism, uh, a very small movement, perhaps some 150,000 people worldwide of 14 million Jewish people, a small percentage of a very small percentage. 
maybe some 300 messianic congregations and synagogues, I'm being deliberately conservative in my figures here, practicing Jewish identity, faith, and uh, uh, belief in the light of the Messiah. So I'm now a messianic Jew, a Jew who believes in Jesus as my Messiah. But my subject is really this road to reconciliation. And in the paper that I've written, which is a 10,000 word paper, so I hope you will take the time to read it another time, uh, I try to summarize why Messianic Jews have a role to play in the process of reconciliation. Now I'm going to just read very briefly from my synopsis. Are you still with me? Yeah. Messianic Jews can play a significant part as peacemakers in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The mic has fallen off, but you can still hear me. Messianic Jews can play a significant part as peacemakers in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. A theology and praxis of reconciliation is needed to address its social, political, and psychological and theological dimensions. Previous studies of Messianic Jewish approaches to the conflict are noted and the method of critical political discourse analysis is proposed to strategically engage Messianic Jewish theological discourse with the discussions of other conflict partners in a number of overlapping conflicts. Recent discussions of Palestinian and Israeli strategic proposals for conflict resolution provide a context in which a survey of Messianic Jewish understandings of the present conflict and proposals to end it and the contributions of Messianic Jews are analyzed and evaluated. Concluding proposals for the development of a Messianic Jewish theology of reconciliation include the need for hope and the development of intra-group discourse that can engage strategically with other conflict partners. The short summary, the three points are, let's listen to each other. Let's be nice to each other. Let's be reconciled. But I'm going to take you through the argument. Are you with me so far? Let's say this, a complex system of conflict complexes. Can you say that, please? <laughs> a conflict system of conflict complexes. A bit faster, please. A conflict system of conflict complexes. I want you to come away singing this. A complex system of conflict complexes. As I, as a Messianic Jew, on my journey to understand the nature of the conflicts and how I can play a useful part, not as a victim, but as a visionary, I have to see that firstly there's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in which my Israeli and Palestinian brothers are so directly involved. And that is within the broader complex of the Arab-Israeli complex. Let's bring in Syria, Lebanon, possibly Egypt, possibly Jordan. And that is in the broader context of the Middle East conflict complex. Are you getting me? A complex system of conflict complexes. The Middle East with Turkey and Iran. I'm no politician, by the way, I'm not an expert, but I'm just trying to understand. Then there is the conflict complex between Islam and the West. And then there is the USA, Europe, the global powers, all looking with interest in these interlocking, internested conflict complexes. And then the three world religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all meet to fight over this area. And the Arab Spring, I can't even begin to comment on that. So we have, we are locked in a complex system of conflict complexes. There, I've said it, I hope you can. And not only that, but there is a need for the missing piece, reconciliation. And now forgive me, but from my perspective, and you may accuse me of ethnocentricity, but actually I believe in a healthy theology of ethnicity because I believe that ethnic identity, or can I say social identity, is a God-given distinctive that he has given to humanity just as he has given masculinity and femininity to humanity. So I'm not denying the significance of ethnicity, but I'm looking for a healthy theology of ethnicity. Read Chris Wright's book, Mission of God, if you haven't already, to find it. I am therefore seeing myself in the middle, forgive me for that, 
but I'm looking for my reconciliation partners within the church. First, my Palestinian brothers and Christians. And then my wider friends, Chaukat Mukhari from Syria and I, we spent all our time debating on and off stage uh, in our studies, great friendship, real reconciliation. We still don't agree on everything, but there you go. And then I'm going to, please forgive me, Stephen Sizer, if you're here, I need reconciliation, and within the church as the body of Christ, we need reconciliation between what I would label Christian anti-Zionist. Actually, Ben White, if you're here, and he's a good friend as well, I'm labeling you just for the moment Christian anti-Zionist. I know you'd want to be labeled positively in a way, but forgive me, the PowerPoint was done late. <laughs> Stephen Sizer, if you're here, and I count you a friend as well, and I'm sure the tape has picked on that as well, anti-Christian Zionist. Do you see the difference? Some are Christians opposing Zionism, Others are Christians opposing Christian Zionism. Some of you are here today. Uh, and then the wider church, which for me as a Messianic Jew is not always a, com a comfortable place to be because of supersessionism, anti-Judaism, uh, um, a teaching of contempt that has flowed through the church over many centuries that I often am suspicious of. And then the Christian Zionists. We even need to love Christian Zionists. Do you know that? We even need to love Christian Zionists. Even if we're anti-Christian Zionists, we need to be reconciled. So the reconciliation partners are there. What do I mean by reconciliation? I begin with God reconciling the world to himself through Jesus, obviously. But in terms of social and political studies, reconciliation is beyond conflict resolution. It goes beyond conflict resolution, changing the motivations, goals, beliefs, attitudes, and emotions. Somebody I had breakfast with this morning said to me, I came as an advocate and I leave as a peacemaker. Advocacy is important, of course, but peacemaking is that broader sense of truly seeing resolution. It changes the nature of the relationships between the parties and the parties themselves. So resolution... Reconciliation requires, and if we are going to see it not just in the body of Christ, but on the international scale and in the Arab, in the Israeli-Palestinian context, resolution of the conflict, mutual acceptance and respect, development of a sense of security and dignity, establishment of cooperative interaction, institutionalization of conflict resolution mechanisms. You say to me, Richard, you're over-optimistic. Yes! I'm a visionary. It's beyond optimism. It's a vision for peace, justice, truth, and reconciliation. I used uh, uh, John Paul Lederach's book, Building Peace. Has anybody read it here? I hope you have. It really helped me to understand. He looks at the words from Psalm uh, 88, I'll go over uh, 85, truth, the open expression of the past, to be honest, mercy, forgiveness to enable new relations and relationships, justice, the, re the restitution and social restructuring necessary to change communities that are in bitter opposition into partners for peace. And peace, a future well-being and security for all the parties. I would love us to take time to meditate on those words from Psalm 85, verse 10. A psalm that talks about restoration to the land and is part promise and part lament and comes up with this wonderful phrase, mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The truth that helps me to acknowledge the things that I've done wrong, the transparency not to be politically manipulative in presenting myself, the revelation from God that goes to our hearts Humility, integrity, simplicity, Chris's words in Cape Town. And linked to truth, mercy, to be able to forgive and accept and to support and have compassion and healing. 
Justice, equality. I know some people, we, we haven't got time to play with the definitions, mishpat, justice, tzedakah, righteousness, but basically equality and right relationships, restoration and restitution, and peace, harmony, unity, well-being, security, and respect. Are you with me so far? I've got three minutes left. Strategic engagement of discourses. I've found that I use discourse. As a theologian, I'm trained to analyze discourse. It's not just exegesis, it's not just hermeneutics, it's theological exegesis, which leads to theolog theologization. And all discourses are the ideological manifestations of power. So us theologians, we have to be very careful how we use our discourses and recognize the subversive elements behind them. Intractable conflicts are the most serious political conflicts where settlement and transformation fail or are yet to succeed, 50 years or more. Radical disagreements are the chief linguistic manifestation of intractable conflicts, intersecting the spheres of human difference, human discourse, and human conflict. I'm not a politician, historian, social anthropologist or psychologist, I'm just a theologian trying to analyze discourse at this moment. But what I see is that there needs to be for reconciliation the strategic engagement of discourses. In other words, we need to articulate clearly what we think and engage with others. The first level is within our own conflict party. And it's wonderful to see my Palestinian Christian brothers and sisters thinking strategically and articulating together. And please pray for myself and my Messianic Jewish brothers and sisters to do the same. Then there is a scope for communication across the spectrum between the conflict partners. And then there can be a greater clarification of the task by peacemakers and internal and third party activists, third party involvement. So what you have, do you like my diagram? A hexagon of radical disagreement. Shout it out to me, please. A hexagon of radical disagreement. That's what we have. Because, and the definitions are difficult here, so one person's moderate is another person's extremist. But basically, extremists feed off each other and polarize each other. They antagonize the opposite party, and it becomes a mutual hate session. And then the moderates are the ones who want to try and get together, but they're trapped in the middle. Do you ever feel like that? Feel like that a lot of the time. And then the moderates have to address the extremists, and the extremists have to address the moderates, and within each party we have to address each other. Not easy, is it? We're not going to solve this problem in overnight. And as I, as I have been growing into this journey, I've really understood the power of narratives and what Robert Rotberg calls the double history of the Israeli narrative and the Palestinian narrative, because we shape our lives through narratives. The narrative of scripture gives us our faith. And there's a competing set of narratives. There are two competing diametrically opposed narratives. We're predominantly hearing one narrative here, but come the other side of the checkpoint and you'll hear the other narrative you're well aware. Of course, this is the marginalized narrative here, so it needs to speak louder and be heard more clearly. And that's why I'm here, because I want you to do that, to articulate clearly. It try, Rothberg says we must try to narrow but not eliminate the chasm separating one strongly affirmed reality from another and therefore foster dialogue and understanding. Now, if it was just narratives, that would be okay, but there's also imbalances and asymmetries of power. And you are well aware of this. So we have to move from there and look at the discourses. And in my paper, I study the Palestinian intergroup discourse and the proposals that it makes a sovereign Palestinian state, a single binational state, a single democratic state, a confederation with Jordan and a Palestinian state. All these are acceptable to some extent. There are unacceptable proposals. And then for the Israeli discourse, there are also acceptable and unacceptable proposals. 
Four possible homes are envisaged. By the way, if you haven't read these studies, please do, because they represent the best of strategic thinking that I've been able to find on both sides. A Jewish home with high walls and a Bantustan. Two homes for two peoples, good neighbours. The two-state solution. One home for two peoples, Israel-Palestine. Can we even say that here without being, uh, I don't know. A shared home, part of a regional confederation. Now, all these political scenarios have their strengths and weaknesses depending on different definitions of identity and ethnicity and sovereignty. But they're all on the table for discussion. So my question is, what do Messianic Jews think? And there's a good saying, where you have two Jews, you have three opinions. <laughs> Do you agree with me? Amen. You're wrong. Five opinions. Uh, and I ask these questions of some of my friends. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about peace? Why? What are your own proposals for a peace settlement? What should Israel do to achieve this? And what can Messianic Jews contribute? And the results are here, out of 45 responses distributed across the globe, across gender, across age. Most of them are pessimistic, and some are very, very pessimistic. A few are realistic, and an even fewer number are optimistic. My brothers and sisters, I hope that you will sit down with them, and I hope they will sit down with you. Why are they pessimistic? Because of the intractable conflict the hatred that they feel to, is coming to them towards Israel. They see no political solution possible. They are aware of the demographic factors. Present circumstances make peace negotiations difficult, not enough will for peace and spiritual factors. But they are optimistic because of the international pressure they see to bring peace, growing Israeli will, increasing reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinian believers, faithfulness of God, of, of the God of surprises, and the return of Jesus. Although that can be an excuse for not doing anything now. Most of them prefer a two-state solution. Although, in fact, there is a number that don't know, and many that say a shared, and some that say a shared state. These are the people that I want to bring to discussions with you. How can peace be achieved? Negotiation, perhaps, or compromise? Stop building settlements, but of course we know the rhetoric there. Strategic engagement of discourses, a truth and reconciliation process, changes of law and constitution, recognizing civil rights, managed hostility. I hate that term, don't you? That is what we have now. Peace movements. And there is great suspicion of facts. Stand firm and wait for Palestinians to cease the rhetoric of Israel discussion. Uh, destruction, says one person. Another says, facts are useless in the real world as there are different narratives all offering facts, many of which are indisputable. So let me ask, what is the Messianic Jewish contribution? Some say there's no contribution, we don't want to know. I beg them to change their minds. There is a special contribution to be made. Prayer, preaching the gospel, reconciliation, Unity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters in Christ. Some say advocating for Israel. Providing hope. Challenging the discourses of power. Opposing injustice. But I would say that we need to build peace together. Thomas Merton said, If this task of building a peaceful world is the most important task of, its time, of our time, it is also the most difficult. It will, in fact, require far more discipline, more sacrifice, more planning, more thought, more cooperation, and more heroism than ever war demanded. We need to build a peace-building infrastructure of hope, of repentance. Chris mentioned that already, Daniel's prayer. I can only repent of my sins and the sins of my people. I'm sure each one of us can repent of the sins of our own lives and the sins of our people. Forgiveness, strategic engagement of discourse and willingness to compromise. Sounds terrible, doesn't it? But I have to say it. An infrastructure provides the social spaces, the logistical mechanisms and institutions necessary for supporting the process of change and long-term vision of peace. 
So let me conclude by jumping to what would my heroes be saying at the checkpoint right now? What would Karl Barth, who I believe is both a supersessionist and a Christian Zionist, by the way, and can we please stop mudslinging one way or the other? Until we've read Karl Barth's Church Dogmatic CD, Volume 2, Section 4, pages 200 to 300. <laughs> because there he ties up the ongoing election of Israel with the way that God blesses all nations. And Bonhoeffer, who we know took his stand against oppression to the death. And Martin Buber, who lived in a Palestinian Arab neighborhood. And Moses ben Maimon, who lived in, an Arab, in Arab countries most of his life and was treated better by the Muslims than by the Christians. What would they say to us at this checkpoint? Seek peace and pursue it. Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad that I stand before the Messiah at the checkpoint before him. And he sees my motives. He sees my thoughts. He sees my ethnicity. He sees my life. And he loves me and he died for me. And he calls me to be a peacemaker. Thank you. I'm sure you have realized that the sun is shining outside. If you go to the coffee break, would you please go outside to the sun and don't block the, the way where people want to go to the coffee. So go all the way out, have your discussion out there and enjoy your coffee break for 20 minutes and then we come back. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.